we're joined by Jeremy Brown, and uh, we'll introduce in one moment. Uh, the withdrawal of the UK from the EU in 2019, as we all know, posed an enormous threat to UK business, in particular to the UK's financial services industry, and more particularly to the City of London. Uncertainty felt in Ireland is magnified in the UK, exacerbated by the more than fluid political context. Our UK business arguably struggled to find its voice uh, before and after the referendum. However, in recent months, and informed by perhaps the changed political landscape, UK business has begun to find its voice and to argue for greater clarity, trust and flexibility in the UK approach uh, to the Brexit negotiations. UK financial services employ a million people, contributing £70 billion to uh, taxation in the UK. The City of London is in the vanguard of that industry and has appointed our guest as its special representative to the UK at this critical time. Uh, Jeremy's role is to represent the UK-based financial and professional services sectors at the highest levels in Brussels and EU member states, with policymakers, regulators, central bankers, MEPs, commissioners and officials. Jeremy himself was previously a member of the British government. He was Minister of State in the Foreign Commonwealth Office with responsibility for British relations with Asia and Latin America, and in the Home Office with responsibility for crime prevention. And he was the Member of Parliament for Taunton from 2005 to 2015. So please, if you give a welcome <laughs> to Jeremy Brown. It's very nice to be here again. I'm flattered that you all um, come to this event. Uh, I was here about eight or nine months ago. I was on holiday in Ireland last month, but that doesn't count on the West Coast. I was here in Dublin about eight or nine months ago. And events have, uh, have developed, obviously, since then. So uh, I plan to spend the next 15, 20 minutes talking about uh, how we see things from the current standpoint in London and how things might progress in the next uh, year or so with regards to Brexit, which is the uh, event that has overshadowed uh, all others in terms of the uh, City of London and its wider thinking. Um, let me start at sort of first principles, which is that uh, our view in the City of London is that London is a pan-European asset. It is not a narrowly British asset. And we encourage the EU side in any negotiations not to think of London as uh, as an advantage held by the people on the other side of the table. In other words, the EU uh, shouldn't measure its success in the negotiations by the degree to which it succeeds in diminishing the City of London. And instead, to try and encourage people to think of London as Europe's global financial centre, Europe's gateway to global markets. And London can continue to be a great asset for European business after Britain has left the European Union. And what is more, London is not easily replicatable, even in the medium term. In other words, the alternative for the foreseeable future to London being Europe's global financial centre is Europe not having a global financial centre, or at least not one that is as comprehensive and uh, admired or respected in global terms as London is today. And I say all of that not to show off or be boastful, although it may come across as both of those things, um, but to try and impress upon people wherever I go across Europe, I visited uh, every member state in the European Union at least once, that London is, is a global scale asset. We in Europe have 7% of the world's population. But if you ask people what are the big financial centres of the world, they say New York, London, Asia, it's a bit more, Singapore, Hong Kong. So we, with 7% of the world's population, have one of the definite standout global financial centres, arguably the most important financial centre uh, anywhere in the world. And although it will obviously change our relationship with the rest of Europe that Britain will no longer be in the European Union, it need not necessarily mean that London cannot continue to act for the wider European economy. So that is my sort of basic fundamental starting point, because what I encourage people to try and think of is that other financial centres have opportunities that arise as a result of Brexit. I don't think anybody in London is pretending that nothing will change as a result of Britain voting to leave the European Union. Um, but that those opportunities are best served by having a approach towards London that is 
complementary or a partnership-based approach rather than one which is, uh, has a more zero-sum uh, analysis and assumes that uh, London's loss is always somebody else's gain. Not least because Europe doesn't exist in a bubble in global terms. And it may well be that businesses in London come to the conclusion that if Europe wishes to degrade its global scale financial centre, they better go to a continent which doesn't wish to degrade its global scale financial centre. And that some of the jobs that leave London migrate to New York or they migrate into Asia, which after all has half the world's population, more than half the world's population, and a lot of the fastest growing economies, and that we shouldn't assume uh, that we have a sum total of financial services jobs uh, here in the continent of Europe, and what we're arguing about is how they're distributed across the continent. We have to also think in terms of our uh, collective economic uh, well-being, and by collective in terms of this conversation, I mean Britain having a collective ongoing interest with those of the economies of the other 27 member states of the European Union. So what are the uh, City of London objectives in this uh, negotiation? And we identify three, and so let me, for the substance of what I'm going to say, uh, dwell on each of those. They are very broad categories, almost so broad that they, um, uh, that they open up whole other levels of discussion. But our first of all, our biggest objective is that we carry on having, we Britain and we London, carry on having a uh, comprehensive trading relationship with the rest of our continent after Britain has formally left the European Union. And uh, we, uh, I think, have to acknowledge that it will, as I say, be different. We will, according to the uh, um, template laid down by the British government, Britain will not be in the single market anymore. And obviously, being in the single market is materially different from not being in the single market. But that nevertheless, um, we hope and believe that uh, the EU can see Britain as its greatest external partner and uh, its most important trading relationship as well as other relationships beyond our immediate scope in the City of London uh, after Brexit. And that the City of London is central to that relationship. So we very much want to see a trade agreement that involves a um, substantial chapter on services generally and financial services specifically, and it's not limited as some trade agreements are uh, to uh, more limited scope on goods more narrowly, uh, which is obviously in the British uh, interest because more of our economy is service-based than the average across the European Union but we see that as being mutually advantageous for all parties. And when I go around the EU, what I uh, commonly encounter is a willingness to have a comprehensive trading agreement. People differ on how long it will take to get there, um, precisely what nature it may uh, have in the final analysis. But I think there is an acknowledgement that it makes sense for everybody for this uh, to for us to have a, a workable trading relationship between the EU and <clears throat> by far and away the biggest economy in the continent of Europe that will not be in the EU, namely Britain after Britain has left the European Union. Um, and I think there's also a willingness for it to be a tailor-made relationship, even though obviously that will be harder than uh, trying to have an off-the-peg solution. In other words, there isn't an off-the-peg solution. Uh, there isn't a way of taking a, a document and crossing out the words Norway or the words Canada and putting the words UK in instead and saying, great, that's done and dusted. We'll use that as the basis. Uh, that The relationship between Britain and the rest of the EU will be a unique relationship, much more comprehensive than the EU has with other external parties. And therefore, it will require, even though it will be painstaking to get there, a bespoke uh, agreement between uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom. And I think that is widely expected or accepted as a, as a desirable end objective. The second of our uh, goals is that we should have some sort of uh, meaningful and tr smooth transitional period which enables us to get from where we are today to that end point that I just described. Uh, 
Now, when I go around the European Union, although people do accept that we will need to have a particular bespoke agreement for the final trade deal, what is not accepted is that there will be a bespoke uh, arrangement for the interim transitional arrangements. Uh, what is widely said to me, and I think this is increasingly uh, becoming a settled view in Britain as well, is that any transitional arrangements will have to be based on some existing model. Now, it may be a variant on an existing model. I think it is likely to be a variant on an existing model. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it will not be a model designed from scratch, not least because we have to negotiate the terms of the departure and we have to negotiate the final permanent deal. And so to give ourselves a whole third area by having to negotiate from scratch an interim deal, I think a lot of people think is uh, impossible in, in terms of the time constraints and the capacity on both sides. And the City of London would like to have a meaningful transitional arrangement announced sooner rather than later as well, because the longer we delay, the less valuable it becomes in business planning terms. And I think what people broadly envisage uh, and would like is some sort of roadmap, if you like, to get us, as I say, from where we are now to where we might be in uh, four or five years' time. So Britain will leave the European Union uh, on the current table in March, timetable in March 2019, by which time we will obviously have needed to negotiate the terms of departure. Uh, nothing else we will have to have negotiated by then, but uh, it would be obviously very worrying for people on the British side and the Irish side and, and more widely across the EU if we hadn't negotiated any form of future relationship at the point where we left where on the Tuesday Britain was a full member of the single market of the European Union, on the Wednesday we had no relationship with the EU at all, would obviously be uh, alarming and disruptive for business as well as for other areas of society. So uh, if we're not able to step straight in 2019 from being a full member of the EU to a full comprehensive trade agreement, and I've met nobody in the EU who thinks that that is viable within the timescale, we are going to need some sort of bridging arrangement to get across to that end point. Uh, and I think you need to know two things, really, when in life when you step onto a bridge. One is how long the bridge is, and B is roughly where it's going. Uh, so we will need to have some agreement up front about how long this bridge lasts for. People seem to think two years to three years, probably pushing it going beyond three. There's probably some people on the EU side as well who would like this to be resolved reasonably quickly, consistent with trying to get a, a business-like resolution. So it's not just, I think, on the British side, a desire to press on uh, a bit with getting this resolved. Um, but it obviously has to be long enough to be meaningful. So maybe, uh, and politically acceptable, which is always a calculation. So let's um, say for the sake of argument, two, two and a half, three years, something like that feels about right. Uh, businesses would probably like it to be longer, but as I say, some considerations need to be balanced. And I think if we have not got to the point where we know what the future deal looks like by March 2019, which we won't have done, and which in any case would make the need for a bridge largely redundant if we had, we do need to have some sort of broad idea about what is at the other end of the bridge before we step onto it. I don't just mean we, Britain. I think it's in the interest of all parties. And the analogy I sometimes use is we, we will need to have designed the architecture of the uh, future relationship, the basic house. Even if this house is not yet fit for human habitation, the rooms are all empty, we know in rough terms what it looks like by March 2019. And we can use the bridging period to fit out the rooms and make it fit for human habitation two or three years uh, down the line. So that is what, uh, what I think people in the City of London are broadly hoping for and envisage being a workable uh, uh, route from getting from where we are now to uh, a future relationship. Of course, you have people who say, well, that's not long enough to negotiate a comprehensive uh, trade agreement. Uh, there will always be um, people who will feel that more time is necessary, but of course, they have to be balanced against, as I say, other considerations, not least political considerations, where there are not absolute truths, but where I suspect uh, there will be some people on the British side that will say, having voted to leave the European Union in June 2016, uh, if five years later Britain has not uh, fully left the organisation, that feels like, for a lot of voters in Britain, I think like quite a long period uh, 
for the British government to have delivered in full the outcome of the referendum. So the city has to be sensitive to the wider political dynamic that um, both the British government and the European Union are uh, obviously alert to in all of their activities and thoughts. And then the final area for us is not really a discussion we need to have with the European Union as much as with the British government, which is the view in the City of London that London's success is dependent on being a highly internationalised, outward-looking global hub of activity that can attract people, uh, entrepreneurial, innovative, creative people from around the world, including from around our own continent. I think it's widely accepted that uh, we will not have absolute freedom of movement with the European Union after Britain has left the EU, with one big caveat, which is the country I'm standing in now, where it seems to be... I thought for a while, actually, there may be some uh, opposition elsewhere in the European Union to a common travel area applying between one member state, namely Ireland, and the UK post-Brexit. But I've not heard that. Uh, even, even countries that uh, have a very large number of their citizens living in the UK, who you might think would say, well, hey, wait a second, why are the Irish getting a, a better deal than us? I thought the whole point is we're meant to have unity among the 27. And now we suddenly find out that the Ireland Irish have managed to negotiate their own agreement. Um, I haven't heard that. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about it in case people start. To start talking. But um, so uh, with, with the big exception of, of, of Ireland for all kinds of uh, obvious historical reasons that predate uh, either Ireland or UK becoming members of the EU, with the exception of Ireland, we are obviously not going to have complete freedom of movement between the UK and the rest of the EU. Um, but the City of London would like to have as liberal market-based immigration system as the British government feels able to deliver. And we believe it's very important for our uh, success in the future. Just as an indication, about 30% of people in the City of London are not British. People who work there, it's hard to get a precise measurement, but it's about that, roughly a third. Um, which, actually, quite interestingly, a minority of those are from elsewhere in the European Union, including Ireland. There's a lot of Americans and Japanese and others. So uh, um, of that 30%, it's about 60% of the rest of the world and about 40% of the rest of the European Union. But it's a highly internationalised centre uh, and can only succeed on that basis. And we don't just mean uh, attracting people who are paid millions of pounds a year to run big banks. Uh, by and large, they seem able to um, look after themselves. But also, of course, in numerical terms, we're talking very small numbers of people. Uh, what people in the City of London are more anxious about is um, being able to attract uh, clever, dynamic young people, not necessarily young, but often are young, um, who have the ability to be great wealth creators in the future, um, even if they haven't yet got to the point where they've created any great wealth. And of course, it's very hard to design an immigration system which measures future potential. <laughs> and therefore, our nervousness is that we will have too inflexible a system. And for example, a um, you know, technologically innovative, clever Estonian uh, who has got a proposition up and running in his or her home country and who might currently go to London to expand that proposition may be disincentivized to do so in the future. And that causes more nervousness, I think, in London than what you might think in terms of higher paid um, top level staff. I would say to people, or maybe I'll conclude on this thought, say to people that we shouldn't measure our success by... Um, uh, assuming that we reach some sort of evolutionary end point in financial services provision in June 2016. And our task is to try and make sure that nothing changes for the rest of time, because we'd cracked it, we had achieved a winning formula. The reality is that City of London, financial services, business generally, uh, is always evolving. There's a constant, organic, rolling Darwinian dimension to it. And if Britain had voted to stay in the European Union... Uh, it wouldn't, it's not the case that nothing would have changed in the 10 years afterwards. Who's to say how many people would be employed by Barclays or HSBC or any other organisation in the City of London 10 years after the referendum? Uh, that depends on all kinds of factors to do with global competitiveness, uh, to do with innovation, a lot of factors not uh, directly in the gift of politicians. What London needs to try and do is make sure that it remains the indispensable 
centre for financial services activity, certainly in Europe, and I'd say in the world, and that people go to London because they see it as being a hub city that is not replicated anywhere else, uh, as I say, certainly in this continent and further afield. And that's the task for us. The task for us is to think, how can we uh, be the centre that businesses in Ireland will value five years, 10 years, 15 years after Britain has left the European Union. And that does rely, to some extent, on our relationship with our near neighbours. It relies on the policies we implement at a domestic uh, level uh, in Britain itself. And it relies on our, the disposition of our businesses, their mindset, their ability to be innovative and think globally. And uh, for us, uh, I think a lot of people in London feel very comfortable with the partnership with Dublin and with Ireland, see it as having um, flourished in recent decades, uh, uh, don't in any way uh, um, uh, want to see uh, any diminution of, of that relationship in the future, and can see the benefits of having the partnership arrangement that we can see with our own eyes as we travel around Dublin now. So, as I say, it's very good to be here. I think it's a sort of meeting of minds. Uh, obviously, Ireland has to plough its own furrow. Ireland has to uh, discharge its responsibilities as one of the 27. Uh, we're not asking for special favours in terms of um, the way the Irish uh, behave towards London and the British, uh, as distinct from how other countries in the EU behave towards London and the British. But we do value the relationship that we have uh, built over many years, and we see a strong working relationship and strong complementarity after Britain has left the EU.